Uh, thanks for, for coming. Um, so in this presentation, I'll be talking about streaming best practices um, uh, with Apache Pulsar as well as Apache Druid. I didn't put them both on the slide, but um, this is for uh, machine learning enablement and analytics, um, as well as there are many other benefits that I'll talk about um, that will be elicited in this presentation. So um, get ready, it's gonna be good. Um, little background, I'm a senior data engineer at Overstock. Um, we focus, uh, on my team, we focus primarily on streaming data, but we use uh, a number of technologies that I'll be talking about today. Um, I won't talk about all of them, but um, I think the stuff that we're doing at Overstock is really exciting. Um, we do have uh, some open recs, so if you're interested in what we're doing, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, so is to kind of set the context around this presentation, um, I, this, this 2017 study reported that leaders focus on data as central to their organizational strategy and choose to concentrate on data flows rather than data stocks. So this is really a key distinction, um, data flows, meaning streaming data rather than stationary data. So in this talk, I'll be talking about how to do this effectively, and um, I'll be sure to answer any questions at the end. Um, I'm also going to give you a lot of unsolicited advice, so I hope you'll be able to put it to good use. I tend to do that. Um, I'll also cover some architectural patterns. Um, if you want more details on architecture uh, patterns specifically, um, I'll give you a QR code at the end of this presentation that gives you uh, other videos where I talk about them in more depth and have animations as well. Uh, a 2015 study reported that big data are worthless in a vacuum. Its potential value is unlocked only when leveraged to drive decision-making. To enable such evidence-based decision-making, organizations need efficient processes to turn high volumes of fast-moving and diverse data into meaningful insights. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about how to create these efficient processes so that you can get these meaningful insights. Um, it's really key. There are a lot of ways that people approach this uh, subject, but not a lot of ways that are super effective. So we'll talk about what really distinguishes the most effective approaches. And then what are the downsides of not having a data story? Now, this might be obvious to some of us, um, but uh, I think it's still worth mentioning. So having a poor data story means that your company's data scientists and engineers often need to put on a forensics hat to get any meaningful insight out of your data. Um, anybody who's started a new job or has gotten access to a new database and given a new challenge um, where they need to figure out you know, what data they need uh, to solve some kind of a problem or to provide some kind of report, I'm sure has gone through this process where you look at the data, a lot of times it's not automatically intuitive. Um, you have to reach out to a lot of people to try and figure out what it is, what it means. You run queries, they don't quite give you what you're expecting. Then you have to join on something, you have to filter. It can be very time consuming. And so if you don't have a good data story, if you don't have the right platform for data, then you end up having to put on a forensics hat and it takes an enormous amount of time. And especially for data scientists, they get, you know, kind of the, the short end of the stick. Um, you know, they're often thrown into a situation and expected to give insights and, and meaning um, and predictions and things. Um, and if they can't quickly get understanding of that data, then their time is totally wasted. And so you could think of it like, uh, you know, forcing a kid to clean a messy bedroom that's not even theirs, right? You know, it's just not, to it's just totally not fair. Um, but even aside from the moral aspect of it, um, poor data quality can cause major problems to not surface until far later in the process. And I'm sure many of us have gone through this as well, right? You, you start on a project and then you get through, you know, maybe it's a big project and then it ends up getting scrapped or it ends up drawing out, you know, many times longer than initially expected because additional findings or information was not uh, uncovered until later in the process after a lot of work has, has been done. Um, and so when that happens, rework and redesign can be very, very expensive. And sometimes it's so expensive that you just can't repeat, you know, you can't do it. It just gets scrapped. Um, and one of the factors of this is when projects are bottlenecked by need to obtain particular information that should have been provided earlier. Um, and so this can lead to abandoned efforts. When, um, and perhaps, well, it, Kind of along this um, this line is that when questions are hard to answer or time consuming to answer, then decision makers often skip the process and they trust in their gut. You know, they kind of go on an intuition, which sometimes works out, but 
you know, sometimes it doesn't. Often I would say it doesn't. Or, or maybe it's a slight miss. And sometimes, you know, it's just like if you're trying to fly to Hawaii from, you know, New York, if you're off by one degree, you're going to be way off by the time you get close to your destination. Um, and you're going to require a major course correction that would have been super easy early, uh, earlier on. So when it's difficult to get information or insights from a platform, then what happens is decision makers, they may skip the process of building analytics uh, to try and get the required answers. And that can lead to shortcuts and dangerous assumptions that can lead to major, major failures. And it can kill an organization. Um, and I'm going to give an example of an organization that was killed by something like that. Um, and so decision makers in those situations, um, they might take what they think are risk averse paths, um, but those paths may actually create more risk. Um, so for example, um, hopefully we're all aware of Blockbuster Video, right? It used to be like, if you wanted to rent a video, that's where you'd go. Um, well, they made a decision to not invest in online video rental. They were given, actually they were given a lot of data even, um, where they were shown about Netflix and this new market opportunity. And um, there's, you know, it's not just a data problem here because they were presented with some data. Um, there's also a cultural issue here. Um, but I think the story is still important to think about because they could have, um, they could have easily invested in that and they would have had far more resources uh, to obtain market saturation and really advance in online video rental. Uh, and then later that turned into streaming video um, uh, and that would have been to compete with Net Netflix. Well, instead they, they just kind of trusted in their gut and threw out the data. Um, and uh, as a consequence, they went bankrupt. They, and you know, you don't really see Blockbuster. I think there's one Blockbuster video rental store left in the, in the world. <laughs> um, so decision makers, when they can't quickly access important data, of course there's the cultural aspect, but if you have a culture of learning and of experimentation and of leveraging data, which is made possible by having the right platform for getting that data, um, then that helps organizations survive when the markets shift. Um, and as a notable example of a market shifting, uh, COVID-19, I mean, organizations that couldn't quickly adapt, they just shut their doors. Um, so think about like restaurants, for example, um, the restaurants that were quickly able to, um, uh, to um, when they, they, if they had the agility to um, quickly get in, you know, the food into people's homes without, you know, in like contactless forms or, uh, or in other ways, that agility is made possible, um, well, for software organizations, especially when you have the right data. So let's talk about improving productivity. Reducing the bar barrier to accessing good data improves the ease of making data-driven decisions, which is good for business and great for your partners and customers. Now, I guess in the case of COVID, like everybody is aware that this is a market change, right? Um, a lot of market shifts are more subtle. Um, especially when you have kind of a niche market, it's, you know, not typically something that every newspaper and magazine is blasting out, you know. Um, and so if you don't have the data to give you that insight, then you can have holes in what you're seeing and you, you can easily end up with, um, with new markets popping up, like in the Netflix example. Um, and suddenly, you know, some startup comes along and obtains market saturation before your company even realizes what's going on. Now, if you have data that's available in real time, uh, you can, and that can easily be quickly explored, you can have entirely market, entirely new market opportunities open up, and you can quickly leverage that and, be, and obtain market saturation in those new markets. So let's talk about some of the challenges with typical approaches to data preparation. Um, so we'll talk about ETL. Now, I mentioned ETL here with ELT, um, which we'll talk about both. Um, they both have pros and cons, but for what they're most often used for, uh, for building analytics and for pumping data into data lake or data warehouse, oftentimes um, what seems like the obvious path um, can be quite catastrophic and we'll talk about why. So if you're not familiar with, with ETL, um, the acronym stands for extract, transform, and load, right? So it's just a process for getting data um, in, from one place to another largely. And then e ELT, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but for now, think about both of them. So this batch approach um, can be useful for solving problems, but there are major architectural issues that can appear. Um, and oftentimes these don't occur until you've built a, a complex pipeline or, or migrate a lot to this approach. 
Um, and that's very, very difficult and expensive to try and fix. So we'll walk through an example of this. I think that I, I created an animation that I think will illustrate it. So let's say we're extracting data from two tables and performing a join, right? Pretty straightforward. We have an update in our data, one of our upstream tables. And so that means our downstream data set's now outdated. So we've got to repeat the process um, to get uh, the new information. And then another value changes upstream. And so again, we repeat the process. Okay, now let's, let's scale this up, right? We've got now a third table that we need to join. Same thing, right? We're performing this operation and we have updates. And so we have to keep performing the same computations. Notice that almost all of the join operations, if you were to look at a low level, almost all of it's repeated unnecessarily. It's totally wasted. And the more you scale that, um, the more brittle it becomes. You know, if you have many, many tables and they're all getting joined and you have, you've chained these operations together, right? Now you have other dependencies. I've seen cases where people are performing joins on, on 12 or more tables with very complex case logic, it can be thousands of lines of code, it can be very difficult to read. And when these tables have millions or billions of rows, um, these operations don't perform well. And it can take so long for data to update through one of these paths, you know, like on this side, um, that by the time you're pulling data from this other side, your states might not match what you're expecting. And you can end up with totally inconsistent or inaccurate views of your data. Um, and you know, this is just what, five tables um, that are being changed. You've got some views here. Um, imagine if you've got hundreds or thousands, um, it just really becomes a problem. And so you can end up with this complex web um, that can be very difficult to debug. And it can be difficult to find the exact path uh, when trying to track down the source of an issue. Um, and then for recurring operations, these processes are super fragile. Right? A change upstream uh, can result in a cascade of breaks. And then nobody wants to touch the tables, right? Have you ever heard that before? In an organization, there's like a table uh, or a database and people are afraid to touch it because they're afraid of, of all the things that can break and they might, it might cause breaks that you know, are in code that people haven't touched in six months or longer um, or that the people who had the understanding of that code have left the organization. Um, and um, it, it can be a major problem. So when a limited number of people know how to maintain these jobs in the code, the learning curve just makes it worse, right? Further slows progress and then engineers burn out, they leave, and then they're replaced by people without internal knowledge of the processes. Anyway, so um, there's another aspect here, which is that uh, history often isn't captured. Um, so you think about the databases all being stateful, right? Well, if you have state that changes today, and then you perform a join as if that state had already always been the case, well, your, your view is not going to present the actual truth of what happened. So having um, a stateless log based approach um, where you're cap capturing that data in real time and storing it as it really is uh, can be far more useful for that reason. So you don't end up with queries with super complex case logic where you're trying to reconstruct the past. Um, so uh, as reported in the literature in 2017, Developers soon began to realize that ETL pipelines were difficult to build and maintain. Cranking up the frequency of ETL to hourly say was an obvious solution, but it merely stressed rickety ETL pipelines even more often past the breaking point. And then with each step in the pipeline I mentioned, you know, those compute resources aren't free. In fact, compute today is far more expensive than storage. And so um, I'm gonna show you how recurring operations can like the same same things, right? The the joints can be happen uh, can be handled in a stream rather than through batch operations. And this is just one example animation. If you want more of this kind of thing, um, I'll talk about that. But um, I've got other videos that go into more depth. Um, but so just kind of at a simple level, um, a stream based approach. Basic idea is that um, as your data comes through in real time, you can update. So in this case, this is an enrichment flow, which is just one of many patterns. But you notice that we're just performing a single update to that message as it comes through. Um, and if the tables are like key value caches or dictionaries, then the lookups are O of one, so they're cheap, um, they're very fast. Um, you can have other processes to update. Like in this case, you can, um, uh, you know, this is one case where we're pop populating a cache. The website is reading from the cache and getting that data. You could eat just as easily have the website. Um, or app be subscribing to a stream and getting that data in real time. There are other approaches that, that can be taken. 
Um, but notice that we don't have this like huge monster of wasted computation. Um, and so it, it stays very simple and lightweight. So as a matter of best practice, um, you need to be building a unified messaging fabric if you wanna get the benefits of this. And these benefits, they really transcend the paradigms of like a data warehouse or data lake. Um, because when you are able to create streaming assets, you can accelerate your productivity. And we found that Apache Pulsar was the ideal technology to build this platform on. Um, and one of our pi uh, pipes, um, we're, we're sending that data into, into, into Druid. Um, so the data warehouse and data lake paradigms, they were very influential in the industry, but they do miss something critical, which is that they focus too much on the stationary data and they miss the focus on how data are created and utilized. And that's actually more important if you think about it, right? If you can't use your data, then what's it for? Um, and we are probably all know this, but data warehouse can, is comprised of data stocks. Sometimes, you know, it's curated, um, but those stocks are typically ob obtained through recurring execution and batch operations. Now, unless your organization is moder modernized and you're doing a lot more of that in the stream. Um, and then a data lake um, also is comprised of data stocks. The big difference between data warehouse and a data lake is data lake it typically includes unstructured data. Um, it can utilize things like object storage in the cloud or with a distributed file system like HDFS. And typically leverages technologies that are designed to infer the schema uh, from the data. So we call that schema on read. Um, technologies like Presto are good for that. And so this unstructured data uh, be, you know, can be really valuable for data scientists. And if you think about how things have evolved over time, um, prior to this data lake movement, many companies were totally ignoring that data, even though it could have been useful. So they started adopting this new mindset of, okay, well, we don't know if this is gonna be useful. We're gonna capture it anyway. We're gonna send it up to, to the cloud, put it in the data lake. And if it's useful for someone later, then great, then we have it. Um, unfortunately, when you do that a lot, you end up with a swamp. Um, it, you know, when anybody can just dump data into data lake and they make changes to it, and nobody's really thinking of the, you know, the after effects of making changes to that data, then it can be very difficult. You can even break your schema on read technologies if that schema is constantly changing. Um, and if anyone has ever tried fishing in a body of water, it looks like this, uh, they'll know that snags in your fishing line can become a serious bottleneck to your productivity. So what you really want to be building is more like a data pantry um, and with streaming assets. And so in a data pantry, your assets are curated and made available for um, immediate use without mining or fishing or digging for what you need. Um, so the idea is that um, you want your data to be, or your streams to be plug and play, right? Where you can very easily um, put data into the fabric and make use of that data. You can plug it into, you know, you can send it to storage technology, or you could even send it to multiple types of storage technologies so that depending on the use case, um, your developers can use the technology that is most appropriate for the job at hand. Um, and so instead of taking the other approach where you try and use one technology for like everything, and I, I'm sure many of you are have seen that happen with relational databases where they get totally abused, um, you can uh, instead use the stream as your source of truth, put that data into many different places um, and use the technologies just for what they're best at doing. And so, um, the fundamental piece of the stream architecture is the data itself. And when you're able to uh, use that, um, the stream as your source of truth, um, it opens a lot of doors. And then you can do your curation in the stream as well, right? You can have stream functions uh, that can be designed in a highly reusable and generic way that allow, to, allow you to process, curate, and store your data um, to enable your analytics and machine learning workloads. And so you could think of like a function mesh, right? Uh, where your functions are reusable, so you can just, if you need to build a new flow, you can easily drop in the functions that are most appropriate. Uh, and then you can, you know, in, in a matter of minutes, you can build a whole new flow for your data um, that is building features that are highly curated and ready for use for other workloads. Um, and then we, like I mentioned, we, we used Apache Pulsar to build our solution uh, or the kind of the key part of the, fa the fabric um, Apache Pulsar has uh, serverless functions, and so we were able to make use of those quite heavily in this case. Um, now, for more complex stream processing, in that case, uh, a stream processing engine like Apache Flink or Apache Spark can help fill the gaps. Um, but we found 
for most most simple cases can be done with just pulsar functions. Um, and then your data producers and consumers are the other critical part of your data, data fabric. So it's important to build automation and visualization to support their needs and to make sure that you're really understanding what types of problems they're trying to solve so you can uh, build your, your platform in a way that supports their needs. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's some streaming patterns. Um, I don't have time to cover them in this presentation, but I'll give you a QR code to my YouTube channel um, later in this presentation, and you can just uh, screenshot that um, and go look uh, and, and watch. I, I actually have a version of this presentation um, in a video uh, that goes into more depth in those, those patterns as well. Um, and then as a matter of best practice, it's important to invest resources into curating features for analytics and machine learning. So we want to be mindful of the consequences of making changes to data, right? We definitely want to expose, you know, you want to capture more data, um, but you also want to be mindful of, of what's happening there, of how it's going to be used. So let's look at what happens to machine learning and data scientists. So their typical data science process involves the preparation, modeling, and deployment steps. Now the meat of this is the modeling step. Right, that's where machine learning scientists should be focusing their time. It's the piece that they're most skilled at doing, the piece they're educated in. Um, it's typically what they enjoy the most. And that, that can sometimes cross a little bit over into feature engineering. Um, but for the most part, that's where they want to be spending their time is building models and experimenting and trying to unlock insight from the data. Um, and in terms of preparation and deployment, like those are things that you can have other people that specialize in those areas focusing on. Um, there's really no reason that a machine learning scientist should be spending all their time doing data cleaning and prep. Um, but the data show, the literature shows that data scientists are spending 60 to even up to 98% of their time finding, preparing, integrating, and cleaning data sets. So is there any question of, you know, why so many machine learning initiatives fail um, when this is the kind of way that, that those folks are spending their time? How are they supposed to build innovative models when that's how their time is spent? Um, and unfortunately, those individuals often lack the authority to change how the data is captured or curated, and that can really magnify the problem. Um, and then I guess one other comment about overfitting models. Well, you know, when you only have a few features, it's really easy to end up overfitting your model um, when you just don't have all the context that you need. And we'll go through an example of, of why that context is so important. Um, and then uh, by leveraging a data fabric, a uh, messaging fabric, um, you can have your, your data scientists uh, able to capture or to, to make use of those, those features that are curated through the fabric, um, and that frees up their time to innovate. So as a matter of best practice, it's important to prepare context-rich streams. So we'll talk about wide streams and why that's so important. Um, first of all, they make machine learning scientists and analysts' lives so much easier. So you think about a wide stream. So basically, you've got messages coming through. They have a lot of properties. Um, and it makes it really easy to identify and collect features for analysis, right? Because you don't have to, you know, the person who's consuming the data doesn't have to try and figure out, OK, where are all these tables? What do they do? What do they mean? What do I join? What keys do I join on? You know, Are there certain cases where this is true or not true? Are there special cases that I need to be considering? Like I mentioned, you know, if the state has changed in your database, do they know that? You know, probably not. Do they realize that, oh, this property wasn't actually, you know, true for anything before 2012, right, or something? Um, so they end up writing case logic after, you know, and, and that's if they find out, which they might not even. So you can have reports that are totally incorrect. Um, and of course, that makes your models not predictive. So then the projects fail, right? So um, by doing more work in the stream, you can curate everything. Um, so that you get more value from your data. So we'll walk, let's walk through an example of why context is important. Um, at Amazon Game Studios, the developers decided to collect game data uh, to influence map design for the game Breakaway. So Breakaway is like Halo, it's a shooter game, I mean, at least in terms of the multiplayer online aspect. Um, and so the developers assumed that the highly contested areas would be these areas, these ziggurats, have these power-ups, right? They thought that that would be those would be really hot territories, um, and their concern um, was that if the you know if player deaths were too evenly distributed across the map, then the map would get boring. People wouldn't play the game anymore. So they decided to track um, the coordinates of where player deaths were occurring on the map. And so they tracked the positions, and so basically they were firing this event every time there was a player death, um, so that they could figure out what's actually happening. 
based on looking at their data. So from that data, they generated a heat map. And the heat map was quite shocking to them. So in this, in this uh, diagram, on the heat map, uh, the whiter colors are where more deaths were occurring. And so you can see that a lot of deaths were occurring right down the strip, um, right in kind of the middle territory, and really you know, not at all on these ziggurats. Like that's probably one of the least contested areas. Uh, and so that was quite shocking to them. So it led to questions like, well, were player, you know, were the power-ups not powerful enough? Or like, why were, it almost looks like players were if intentionally avoiding those areas. Was it because they're, you know, more concerned about risk of death? Um, now, unfortunately, they didn't have more context that would be able to answer some of those additional questions. But you can see even just the context that they did have, how helpful it was in understanding what, what the, you know, what people were actually doing. So let's walk through another example. Um, so in this case, we just have character death, we have a timestamp, we have an ID, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, what happens when we add some more fields, right? Now, anyone who's played the game, the game Clue might recognize this analogy, right? So we've got a person, Mr. Green, location, library, and this death had something to do with this item of candlestick. Um, okay, so that gives us more of the story, but there's still something missing here. Um, so what happens when we add this we add this additional field, right? We're adding just a single of a uh, single ID um, immediately after event ID. So we've got some kind of linkage going on. And we link it to this other event and we join them. And what does this tell us, right? So there's somebody entered a room. There's Colonel Mustard. Oh, hey, they look. They actually entered the same room, and he entered this with the same item, a candlestick. Well, now we have a clear suspect as to what was going on that led to this character's death. Um, so just by having, you imagine if you didn't, if you're missing one field now, I guess you can argue that you could have ordered things by the timestamp, but um, you know, but if you don't have a way to, to join additional context, then you can miss a huge part of the picture. Um, so every single field that you're able to, to add as context can significantly enhance the value of your data. And of course, the more properties you have, the more you can analyze. And it can be really hard to anticipate all the types of analyses that data scientists might want to perform uh, down the road on your data. So um, you don't have to. Like, if you can join everything in the stream, um, then you can make it available. And if they need it, then great. If they don't, then you can archive it, put it in cold storage. And, uh, and then if it's useful at some point, then it can be unlocked. But these days, storage is so much cheaper than, uh, than compute. It's, it's a waste to not do it. Um, and I think this is one of the things that the data lake movement was really trying to accomplish. Um, it's better to store the data than ignore it, even if it's unstructured. Um, but we can go further, right? We can unlock more data, and we need uh, by by being mindful of of how that data might be used and making sure that it can be curated in a way that makes it easy to use. Um, and then you know, so that's I think one of the areas where like the ELT as opposed to ETL, ELT where it's let's just get the data in the data lake and we can handle it, we can deal with it later. You know, it did allow uh, companies to start adopting a culture more around data collection. But like I said, we can go further. And then as a matter of best practice, it's important to use a visualization technology that allows you to explore your streaming data. Um, so we we used Apache Druid um, with Imply. Um, of course, Imply is one of the, one of the sponsors here of this event. Um, and so this is the implied dashboard on some example data. Super easy. So first of all, based on how Druid works, you've got uh, your data structured. So you've got a schema. And you can, in imply, you can drag and drop your those properties so they're considered dimensions um, and just explore them, right? You can see so much. You can gain so much insight into your data with just you know clicking around in the UI. And you don't have to be a developer. So with this technology, no longer are the days where your executives have to just wait for you know your BI developers to come up with write a whole bunch of queries to try and get insight into your data. It's so easy to just drag and drop different measures and dimensions into your into your chart. Figure out you know I mean what you can do is multi-dimensional exploration in real time, and that data is updated in real time as well. You can set up notifications and alerts. Um, that fire you know, week over week if you see a trend that has changed or, or month over month or year over year. Um, so you can really get an understanding of what's going on. You can have real-time alerts if there's a change. Um, you can, I mean, what this allows people to do is gain understanding of the data 
even if it's not documented. Now, of course, I'm a big proponent of documentation. We'll talk about that more. Um, but you can, I mean, you can get in here and drill down into your data. And this would be, I mean, how many how many queries would somebody have to have written to just do all these, um, you know, that only that somebody who's a non-developer um, could just go through and click the boxes and pick, you know, what charts they need, um, what values or what dimensions they want to include. Um, it allows you to do real-time hypothesis testing without even needing to be a developer. And even if you are a developer, you'll notice this, is sa th this saves you a ton of time, right? Being able to see side-by-side -side comparisons, think about all the different roll-ups that you'd have to do um, and, uh, and the filters that you'd have to do, uh, not to mention adding the visualization component. So what this technology allows you to do is real-time multidimensional exploration um, without even needing to be a developer. Super powerful. Um, now, kind of shifting gears here, um, another best practice is to clean up your history. Now, some people take this very strong uh, opinion that you should, you know, never change your raw data. Well, there might be some some merit to that, you know. Uh, you, you can keep that and archive it, put it in cold storage, put it somewhere, uh, inexpensive to store. Um, but for what you're going to be using, you got to clean up that history. Um, for example, like, let's say, there's a field that once was nested and now is flat. I mean, if you're using an uh, ELT approach, schema on read, you, you're going to break your, you know, whether it's Presto or whatever technology you use, it's going to totally break when that schema changes, especially if it changes in a way that's not really backwards compatible. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it can make data hard to work with. Um, but if you can make a change uh, in the stream, then you can change how that data is being produced or, or you can update it in the middle and then you can write a one-time batch ETL or mi migration kind of job um, that will just clean up your history so that um, it all conforms together and so it can really easily be ingested. Like I mentioned, you can still have your raw data, put it somewhere, but, um, but in terms of the data that's going to be used as your source of truth, um, make it clean so that it's really easy to consume. Um, and that raw data will probably never be used. Just based on my experience, when you have clean data, that's what everyone wants to use. Um, obviously, you should document your data well. Perhaps it goes without saying, but um, it's important. Um, you know, data needs a clear explanation of how it's created, or why it's created, what its expected values are, and how it should be used. Uh, I realize we're running out of time here, but I'm almost at the end. And to make a point of that, imagine trying to build this thing uh, with that, you know, this out of Legos without any documentation. Um, I mean, even with documentation, it's quite involved. But it's not fair for your machine learning scientists to have to reverse engineer your data to understand what it's doing. Um, a, a technology like Imply can definitely help, but you still need documentation. Um, I also really like diagrams like these, where um, you have clear steps. This is for a stream-based flow. And you can clearly see what the inputs and outputs are for your functions. It makes it really easy to create you know, an unambiguous schematic of what needs to be built so that people can easily parallelize work on it and, and build what they need. Um, also, you want to focus on your on your on your biggest pain points, right? You want to focus on the shark bite problem, not the mosquito bite problem. Um, that will help you uh, make the most of the time that you have uh, and build the right patterns. And then um, some people think Henry Ford never said this, but I think it's it's still useful. Which is, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? Don't build the faster horse. Uh, build the technology or the platform that will really transform your organization and and enable a better culture of experimentation and learning. That is really the key thing. If, if Blockbuster had adopted a, a culture of learning, they would not have made the mistake that they, that they ended up making. Um, and think about it from this perspective, which is data is the light inside modern organizations, right? Without light, all you see is darkness, right? You, you can't make, it's like if you had your eyes closed while you're driving down the road and you only opened your, your eyes, you know, once every 15 seconds, right? That'd be like the, the batch ETL kind of approach. Um, you're going to miss tons of stuff, right? Um, the more you can, the more data you have, and the more you can work with it, the more agile your your platform is, um, the more visibility you have. So don't be like Blockbuster Video. Um, don't miss your opportunity to build the fabric and the platform that will really transform your organization. Um, resources, go ahead and screenshot this slide. Um, a lot of great videos. Um, if you're interested in Pulsar, I've got Stream Natives link on here. Um, and then the QR code takes you to my playlist. I highly recommend it. Um, the, that playlist includes some videos that I've given at conferences. Um, 
that uh, aren't included in this next one. So screenshot this one as well. This is my YouTube channel. If you subscribe here, then you'll get notified every time I produce a new video. Um, and then for everything else that doesn't show up on this channel, um, you can capture it from, from this one, from that QR code. Uh, questions? Let's see, I can look in the chat. It looks like we've got a bunch of session chat. Okay, restaurants. Okay, so somebody said restaurants not being agile enough to adapt to COVID based on a poor understanding of the restaurant industry. I realize that there's more to it, but um, yeah, I was trying to make a point about um, yeah, and maybe maybe the analogy was was kind of off, but the the main thing is that when you have data, you can react to changes in the market. Um, What are some problems that were happening with your data team science, data science efforts that drove you to implement these best practices? Hopefully I've answered that question. Um, um, it really comes down to the agility of data scientists and trying to make use of, of what you've got. Um, so hopefully I answered that question. Um, what are reasons I chose Pulsar over Kafka? There are a lot. In fact, if you go to my, my playlist, um, I've got a number of, uh, videos that go into that in more depth. Um, so things like multi-tenancy, the functions as a service, um, the uh, ease of governance, um, geo-replication, those are some features. Um, there are a lot. It really, um, I could go on for, anyway, I, I've got videos that cover that. I'm um, using Spark for stream enrichment, forwarding to Kafka topics. How to expose this to BI. Yeah, I mean, one of the best things you can do um, is is put that data, hook up those Kafka topics to Druid um, or, or similar technology. Um, some people have used Elasticsearch as well, but they're, you know, then you have to maintain indexes and things. Um, and uh, yeah, but um, the way that we're solving the problem at Overstock is we're putting that data um, into Druid and using, using Imply um, to expose that. Let's see. Druid is a consumer Kafka stream. You can also put your BI tool of choice on top of Druid. That's true. Um, the questions, if I want to index my data on other columns, not just timestamp, will the querying still be fast? Can I use Druid for historical analysis also? Okay, it looks like that question was answered. Yeah, there are definitely strategies of how to do that. Um, let's see, any other questions? And I would also like to know about the restaurant industry. Um, yeah, what, what was the reason that some restaurants were failing because of not being able to adapt there? If uh, Chris Hubbard wants to answer that. Okay, well, thanks. Well, here's, here's my contact info. Um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any questions that come up, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer any questions. Um.